and welcome to Eddie Hurst's podcast version of The War of the Worlds. Here we are for Chapter 6, The Heat Ray, on Chobham Road. Not the flashiest of titles, admittedly, but there's some good stuff in here. You know, of course, we're dealing with the fallout of the shocking events of Chapter 5, which was, of course, The Heat Ray. This is kind of like um, in Hollywood, you know, when they have a film that's a sequel, but instead of instead of just putting, like, like two, like Men in Black 2, Men in Black colon, on Chobham Road. Where are we? Well, the Martians have shown off the devastating effects of the heat ray, and now we see that the crowd that was surrounding it, they're responding to it, they're reacting to it. Uh, of course, we're going to get HG Wells' trademark hatred of crowds and uh, general common people. We've got a pretty uh, pretty much a banger about a heat ray, uh, if, if I dare say so myself, uh, which I do, so I shall, because he who dares wins, as the phrase goes. Uh, victory favours the bold. That's a phrase. Um, and also, we've got a little bit of a deep dive into HG Wells' prescient predictions on the future with some devastating consequences. Thank you so much for listening along. I hope you're enjoying it. If this is the first episode, welcome. Thank you. But I would highly recommend you start in uh, a chapter one because it's it's very much based on a novel and you're going you're gonna to be a little bit lost. I don't want you to lose out on, the, uh, on, your, on your listening experience here. Please do subscribe to it. Please rate it on iTunes or Podchaser or wherever you get your podcasts from if there is a rating area on there please do that if you're listening on spotify rate rate it on another one because spotify whilst the most convenient for listening to podcasts is the least convenient for podcasters themselves so let's get started um you can follow me on twitter at eddie hurst i'm on instagram i'm on facebook as well you can contact me via all of those or via email eddiehurst at gmail.com if you have any burning questions involving a heat ray or not any question at all Okay, here we go. Chapter 6. The Heat Ray in the Chobham Road. It is still a matter of wonder how the Martians are able to slay men so swiftly and so silently. Many think that in some way they are able to generate an intense heat in a chamber of practically absolute non-conductivity. Hello, it's me, the explaining lad. Uh, not so much of a lad now as I am an old man. My life behind me. Conductivity is... It's, it's so like... Conductivity is, you know, like when heat or electricity passes through a material. That's conductivity. So, like, a copper pan gets very hot. Hotter than other metals because it's got high conductivity or metal... Metal material allows electricity through it, and that's that's because it's conductive to electricity. So non-conductivity would mean that there's no there's no need for for the energy and the heat to pass through something. It's it's immediate heat energy. It's pretty scary if you ask me. This intense heat they project in a parallel beam against any object they choose by means of a polished parabolic mirror of unknown composition, much as a parabolic mirror of a lighthouse projects a beam of light. Hey up, pizza! It's me again! Uh, Just thought I might explain what parabolic means. Parabolic. Parabolic. It's uh, it's like a curve. It's just a shape of a curve. Uh, Like in an X and Y graph. It's it's a GCSE maths. It's a little curve. So it just means it's a mirror, but it's got a curve in it. All right, I'll see you later. But no one has absolutely proved these details. However it is done, it is certain that a beam of heat is the essence of the matter. Heat and invisible, instead of visible, light. Yeah, thanks for explaining that bit, mate. You didn't put what conductivity means or what parabolic mirrors mean, yet definitely you do want to explain the difference between invisible and visible. That's it, you've got us right there. Thanks, pal. Whatever is combustible flashes into flames at its touch. Lead runs like water, it softens iron, cracks and melts glass, and when it falls upon water, incontinently that explodes into steam. Incontinent, it's like, like it's weeing in that, isn't it? That night, nearly 40 people lay under the starlight about the pit, charred and distorted beyond recognition, and all night long the common from Horsell to Maybury was deserted and brightly ablaze. The news of the massacre probably reached Chobham, Woking and Ottershaw about the same time. In Woking, the shops had closed when the tragedy happened. Probably the least they could do, innit? 
and a number of people. Shop people and so forth. You know, shop people. The people of the shops. Just like mole people, but with shops. Attracted by the stories they had heard, were walking over the Horsell Bridge and along the road between the hedges that runs out at last upon the common. You may imagine the young people brushed up after the labours of the day, and making this novelty, as they would any novelty, the excuse for walking together and enjoying a trivial flirtation. You know, what, what we will see in this chapter is that e even though there's been a horrendous massacre and, and there's been some incredible technology revealed, what H.G. Wells really wants to focus on is just how awful and stupid the common people are in this. Like, I mean, sure, we've had a Martian invasion, but can you believe these idiots of the shops? Poor me! You may figure to yourself the hum of voices along the road in the gloaming. As yet, of course, few people in Woking even knew that the cylinder had opened. Though poor Henderson had sent a messenger on a bicycle to the post office with a special wire to the evening paper. Henderson sending a messenger on a bike? It's not going to be the narrator, is it? Because he, uh, he can't ride a bike, can he? <laughs> As these folks came out by twos and threes upon the common, they found little knots of people talking excitedly and peering at the spinning mirror over the sandpits. And the newcomers were, no doubt, soon infected by the excitement of the occasion. Honestly, the way he talks about people's response, it seems like he just wants the Martians to win. He wants them to fry these folks. By half past eight, when the deputation was destroyed, there may have been a crowd of 300 people or more at this place, besides those who had left the road to approach the Martians nearer. There were three policemen too, one of whom was mounted, doing their best, under instructions from Stent, to keep the people back and deter them from approaching the cylinder. There was some booing from those more thoughtless and excitable souls to whom a crowd is always an occasion for noise and horseplay. Oh, all these people getting together having a nice time. Oh. Stent and Ogilvy. Shout out to the board of Anticipating some possibilities of a collision, had telegraphed from Horsell to the barracks as soon as the Martians emerged for the help of a company of soldiers to protect these strange creatures from violence. No, I tell you what, the, uh, the, the rabble that are coming along, the, the shitty rabble that are coming along, uh, they deserve everything they get, but those poor, educated, middle-class academics, they were just victims of their own kindness. After that, they returned to lead that ill-fated advance. The description of their death, as it was seen by the crowd, tallies very closely with my own impressions. The three puffs of green smoke, the deep humming note, and the flashes of flame. Science fiction is known for making predictions about the future in the same way that football is known for being a bit kicky. It's so much part and parcel of the genre that it practically comes with a sorry we missed you slip in the front of each book. And as a founding father of the genre, Wells is no stranger to a foretelling of things to come. We, the founding fathers of science fiction, hold these truths to be self-evident. One, robots are cool. Two, aliens are creepy. Three, crowds of people suck. Four, it's always worth chucking in a guess about the future. We spoke about it a bit last episode, but H.G. Wells was like a Nostradamus of weaponry. The heat ray may have had its origins in ancient weaponry such as Archimedes' mirrors, the weapon of choice for all psychotic boys unleashing fury on anthills, but it held just as much truth for the future, especially here, where we get into a bit more information on the idea of non-conductivity and parabolic mirrors, applying some scientific expectation to the workings, it's unsurprising many claim he invented the idea of the frickin' laser beam! Uh, also, as a, as a little aside, the island of Dr. Moreau is all about genetic engineering to make human-animal hybrids, so actually, you'd be in with a shout to suggest that Wells put together all the pieces for fricking sharks with fricking laser beams on their fricking heads. What? If only he wasn't so limited in vision. We skimmed over it too, but the idea of cylinders from Mars landing on Earth planted the seeds for a Robert H. Goddard to consider liquid fuel for rockets in 1926. You know, the thing that got us to the moon. And uh, also put massive holes in cities during countless wars since. So, uh, morally a bit hit and miss, even if the accuracy of the missiles isn't. In The Shape of Things to Come, in 1933, H.G. Wells foresaw the use of aerial attacks and tanks as commonplace in the field of war, something his friend, and then, uh, not so much friend, Winston Churchill took a keen interest in. But perhaps what Wells is most frequently cited as predicting is the worst weapon of all, the nuclear bomb. In his book World Set Free, published in 1940, 
Machine, he goes deep into the fallout of a weapon which harnesses atomic power. And this is a good 24 years before the first bomb in 1938. But is it really fair to say Wells warned of some of the worst horrors witnessed by the human race? Or is he simply a victim of a series of accidents? As we all are. As I said at the start, people are always quick to say when a sci-fi novel or film predicts future events. I mean, how many times have you seen something described as Orwellian because it just has a resemblance to some sort of surveillance scene in 1984? Even Back to the Future 2 is held up as a prophetic piece of cinema due to the fact it imagined someone selfish and greedy would become President of the United States and that there'd be a bunch of sequels to the Jaws films. But where are the hoverboards? Give us what we want, Mayor Goldie! There's always something about how often we say science fiction predicts the future that just rubs me the wrong way. It's a bit like conspiracy theories, you know? It just seems too neat an explanation or connection to be true. Even a broken clock's right twice a day, so of the hundreds and thousands of books published, there's bound to be some that just by accident get the future right? You know, for every one stab at a mobile phone, there's hundreds of rocket shoes and meals in pill form. According to the psychologist David Ropiek, It's part of the human desire to have control over the uncontrollable have some sort of grip over the chaos of existence that is what drives us to make these connections. The most powerful influence on fear in the mind is uncertainty. So even if it's just thinking that Biff Tannen looks a bit like Donald Trump, that makes our monkey brain settle a bit. So it seems like something that we're hardwired to do. Often, I remember the first time I saw 2001 A Space Odyssey, where they're at the uh, Hilton Space Hotel, and like, everything in there, and even the spacesuits and that, are so, so 1960s. It's as if, even in the year 2001, they couldn't foresee a time that Shagpile and Sickly Orange were no longer fashionable colours and styles. This is uh, something Alexandra Samuel talks about in her article, Can Science Fiction Predict the Future of Technology? I'll, I'll say it's not, not like the specifics of 60s decor, but the general idea of periodic trends been part of sci-fi. It seems that the answer is a pretty positive... Uh, prob I don't know, probably, probably not. Like all stories, those that explore the future are still grounded in the time they're produced. You're creating something for people to read at that time, so you want them to understand it even if it's not set in their time. Rather than like a telescope through the ages, it's more like a mirror that has some stickers of spaceships on it. A lot of predictions fall into two categories. Category 1 is that the foresight is only an acceleration of the attitudes and technology available at that time. This is something Stephen J. DeCamo writes about, in particular with Wells. Like, if you look at all of his machinery, it's still based basically in the mechanics of Victorian machinery. Kind of like if you took a steamboat to the moon instead of a NASA spaceship. The second category is that the technology and future events described are a little light on the technical description. You know, like, people are always keen to talk about how surveillance state is just like what George Orwell described in the book 1984, but then again, people are also really keen to say that the Earth is actually flat. Or that Gremlins 2 isn't the best sequel ever made. So maybe we shouldn't take everything at face value. In 1984 and The Power of Technology, Heinz C. Lugenbiel, alongside having the most fun academic name to say, points out that all the technology Orwell describes is pretty cursory. You know, he's more of an ideas man, it's not like the specifics of, of, of CCTV or or bugs and cameras. It, it's a bit like saying, hey, you know how people don't like being bored? Well, imagine a world where people are never bored, and there's always distractions, and hey, maybe they have like something they can carry around that distracts them all the time, and they're always distracted. That's a safe bet as a thing to write about. It's always going to be true. In Victorian times, they had newspapers, and they had like, like beachside arcades and things, and now it's mobile phones, and then in the future, maybe it's something that's voice activated, or put into your body, or I don't know. It, it sounds more convenient than what we have widely available. It's basically taking a big human desire and just pushing it further than where it is now. But this aside, what, what's particularly interesting with Wells and slightly more depressing is that sometimes it feels like Wells is busting into a room and going like, Hey, scientists, be careful. This could be something really bad. And then the scientists have gone, Oh, great, thanks for this. We had no idea things could be worse than they already were. Let's make it happen. Samira Akma explored this in a great radio documentary and article for the BBC, looking at Leo Szilard, an atomic physicist who took inspiration from the previously mentioned World Set Free. Whilst the idea of nuclear power and fission was knocking around since 1895, after Leo read World Set Free in 1933, he began putting that theory into practice. Focusing on the idea of splitting an atom to release energy, he landed on the notion of a chain reaction. Which in turn set its own chain reaction that led to the creation of nuclear weaponry and to the Manhattan Project. <laughs> 
Before we go back to the book though, I, I would like to say that it's not all doom and gloom with Herbert George Wells' predictions. Whilst he may indirectly have caused some earth-crushing weapons into existence, he was also a big human rights activist, and his 1840 essay The Rights of Man actually went on to inspire the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by the United Nations. He was also outspoken against the South African apartheid, and look what happened there! I, I mean, I, it ended. It ended is what I wanted to say, not not like all the, all the other horrible bits. He didn't inspire that bit. I know that in the first first episode we were looking at his relationship to eugenics and scientific racism and now I'm talking about how he helped combat inequality and structural racism. I mean, I guess a lot like his predictions it's pretty tricky to put him in a single box. You know, maybe people are capable of growing and changing their minds. But that's a bit messy and nuanced and really I'd rather make sweeping generalizations because whilst they're not as accurate they are way more fun. <laughs> But that crowd of people had a far narrower escape than mine. Only the fact that a hummock of heathery sand intercepted the lower part of the heat ray saved them. Had the elevation of the parabolic mirror been a few yards higher, none could have lived to tell the tale. They saw the flashes, and the men falling, and an invisible hand, as it were, lit the bushes as it hurried towards them through the twilight. Then, with a whistling note that rose above the droning of the pit, the beam swung close to their heads lighting the tops of the beech trees that line the road, and splitting the bricks, smashing the windows, firing the window frames, and bringing down in crumbling ruin a portion of the gable of the house nearest the corner. Okay everybody, it's Friday night, so it can mean only one thing, it's open mic night, and what better way to start off than a new song from our in-house punk band. So this is the Hot Ray with his, his song, Heat Ray. Just before they start, the bottle of beer is two for one if you want to go to the bar and order something.
in the sudden thud, hiss, and glare of the igniting trees, the panic-stricken crowd seems to have swayed hesitatingly for some moments. Sparks and burning twigs began to fall into the road, and single leaves like puffs of flame. Hats and dresses caught fire. Then came a crying from the common. There were shrieks and shouts, and suddenly a mounted policeman came galloping through the confusion with his hands clasped over his head, screaming. Ah! They're coming! A woman shrieked, and incontinently. <laughs> it's like weeing and that. Everyone was turning and pushing at those behind in order to clear their way to Woking again. They must have bolted as blindly as a flock of sheep. Where the road grows narrow and black between the high banks, the crowd jammed, and a desperate struggle occurred. All that crowd did not escape. Three persons at least, two women and a little boy, were crushed and trampled there, and left to die amid the terror and the darkness. Pooh! Pretty intense. Stuff is getting very real uh, in, in the book now. I mean, obviously it's not getting real real because it, it's clearly a work of fiction. Uh, Martians have not come from from Mars and gotten out advanced weaponry. That's not happened yet. So, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to be back next week with Chapter 7. How I Got Home! It's, it's, it promises to be a little bit of a lighter sojourn, perhaps. Maybe not. I mean, there is an invasion on, so how light is it going to get at this point? It is called War of the Worlds, so there's probably going to be more war. Uh, just brace yourself for that. But thank you very much. Please do share, tell people about the podcast. The more people we get, it's, it's something, in it? It's something to, to cling on to in our finite lifespan. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Uh, I'm on Twitter, at Eddie Hurst, Instagram, uh, Facebook, all that. Facebook.com forward slash Eddie Hurst. You can go to my website, eddiehurst.co.uk, if you want to. That's an option too. Subscribe, rate the podcast wherever you can. Tell folks about it. Okay, guys, thank you very much. I'll see you next week for Chapter 7, How I Got Home. How I Got Home. Eddie Hurst's podcast version of The War of the Worlds is created and produced by Eddie Hurst. Written by H.G. Wells and Eddie Hurst. The theme tune is Fall of Saigon by Ichabod Wolf. Articles used for research for looking into science fiction and predictions for the future is thanks to Brian Handwerk of the Smithsonian, Samira Ahmed from BBC, Alexandra Samuel, Stephen J. DeCamo, Heinz C. Luzhenbiel, and David Ropiak. Thanks very much, guys. See you next week. Bye!